lot of misinformation out there. People think that if outfitters get tags, that's going to take away from what they have on their public land. I saw something at the end of the lake. We thought it was a moose. And I'm looking at it. I'm like, that's definitely not a moose. And then it starts running and it's a bear. Operating on this lottery system where you don't know if you're going to be able to operate that year is insane. And the fact that we're expected to do it that way is also insane. All of us girls are wearing the exact same shirt. And I'm like, that's not me. So, you know, my my patterns are bright. They're crazy. They're different. I think it's pretty funny when I'm like, here's your purple chubby, you know, to a client. And they look at me like, wait, (laughs) what did she just say? Hi, this is Kara Shewitt with Yellow Sally and Montana Bucks and Ducks, and you are listening to The Wild Initiative. Put down your latte and pull on your boots. I would rest at peace for eternity if my legacy was that I made a positive influence on the non-hunting public about what hunters are and what hunting is. I finally got my buck on our last real day of hunting. So a pro-hunting organization is voting against hunting. And that says anti-hunting to me. There was a year straight where I was averaging up to 200 death threats a day. And I hugged it. Like, I just wanted to hug a bear. It's proven that the average steak in a grocery store touches 50 to 100 hands and machines. And we're putting that into our body. Hey, y'all, Cable Smith, host of the Lone Star Outdoors show here. This is Adam Weatherby. I'm Corey Jacobson with Elk 101. This is Christy Titus. Hey, folks, this is John Bear. You're listening to The Wild Initiative. Hey y'all, welcome to another episode of The Wild Initiative, brought to you as part of the Waypoint Outdoor Collective. Alright y'all, so getting on to today's episode, this is like a special milestone we've got here. Uh, I've, I've got um, my good friend Kara Shewitt here with me, and this is the, it's not the first podcast I've done in person, but this is like the first, like in studio podcast I've ever done and will be the last one in this place with my upcoming move. But so you hold the rare distinction of being the only ever in studio, quote unquote, in studio podcast. Awesome. But uh, thank you so much for coming out and joining. I think we've been talking about, I mean, shoot, we've been talking about this for I think next month will be a year at this point. <laughs> yep, yep. I finally made it over. Um, I'll be guiding over here for a really awesome foundation called Warriors in Quiet Waters. Um, so I thought it'd be a perfect opportunity to come see you, check out the place before you move out. <laughs> yeah, come check out my new place <laughs> that I'm leaving. As I, right. As I have like all the walls downstairs bare. Yep. And... <laughs> I can get the general idea. Yeah, there you go. You know, it's, <laughs> it's the layout. It's all good. But <laughs> so tell us a little bit about uh, Warriors in Quiet Waters. So Warriors in Quiet Waters is a wonderful foundation based here in Bozeman, Montana. Um, They take post- 9-11 9-11 combat veterans out fishing um, and the point of the trip is not to just come out and catch fish it's to teach veterans how to fish so when they go back to wherever they're from they can take these skills that they've learned here and apply them for stress relief um, you know if they're having a bad day they can pick up the fly rod they can go to the river um, just you know it's it's all based around them taking their skills when they go home with them. And so these guys that apply for this, they, they come in, they come out for these trips. I mean, by the time they're leaving, they're fully outfitted. They can, they can pack up their gear and they're set to hit pretty much any, any river or lakeside they need to. Right. Yep. So fish. they have their fly rod, they have flies, they have a pack, they have waders. Um, we do some really detailed um, instruction. So they set up the fly rod the first day they get there. We do um, casting the first day they get there. Um, and I, basically everything in between. They have a companion that stays with them their entire trip to make sure they're happy, they're comfortable, they're having a good time. Um, But I think the biggest distinction with this program is that they also provide trips for the caregivers to the veterans. So a lot of times the caregivers are overlooked. I mean, you know, the vets, you know, obviously they've been through a lot. They deserve a lot. But these caregivers also need a break. They might also want to go fly fishing with the vet that they are taking care of. So it's it's awesome to see, you know, these guys.
flies come out, you know, the first day is a little awkward, a little weird. <laughs> uh, they're like, what is fly fishing? Where are we? But by the end of the week, everybody's happy, loving it, and ready to go home with their new skill. So um, are these, are, do these tend to be disabled vets or is it, is it a mix? What's the... It's a mix. So, you know, we have um, amputees that come out, um, you know, guys who have lost their legs from, from combat. Um, and then, you know, sometimes the, the, the wounds are on the inside. We can't really mm-hmm. see them, but mm-hmm. we definitely recognize all of it. Um, and we welcome anybody who wants to come. That's fantastic. And so... So far this year, have you actually gone out or are you uh, just up here getting ready to go out? So this will be my fourth trip. Okay. Yep. I hope to do many, many more in the future. Um, I was supposed to start in 2020, but COVID delayed a lot of things. So this is my first year doing the trips. It's uh, the most amazing guide trips I've ever had. Uh, no offense to my clients if you're <laughs> listening out there, uh, but it, this is, it's just, a, it's really special. That's really exciting. And it's so uh so tell us a little bit just about some of the experiences you've had and maybe if, you know, you don't have to, don't have to say names or anything, but, uh, you know, tell us about um, some of the people that you've had a chance to take out. So, you know, I think social media, uh, social media is amazing. I love it. I use it to my benefit all the time. But one thing it has done in the fly fishing industry is uh, the expectations are kind of out of control. So I'll take guys out and they're like, okay, I want to, I want to catch a 24 inch Brown today. <laughs> it's my first time fly fishing. And I'm like, Oh yeah, you know, we'll try. I'll, I'll, we'll do what we can. You know, that's kind of a tough thing to do. Um, and, but- and then there's me over here. I'm like, <laughs> I caught a six inch cutty. Yeah. <laughs> so you're like the <laughs> ideal client. Like that's perfect. <laughs> I'm like, I am so happy if I get any, like, and it's actually to the point now where I'm like, it's almost more entertaining for me to catch the small. Cause I'm not going to, I'm not going to catch hog Johnson here. I just, I'm not that guy. It's just not going to happen probably. Right. But if I can catch the smallest fish, oh, that's there you go. something. That's something. <laughs> Still a record. So this last weekend, I took out a guy from Texas, and I'll make sure he listens to this episode. And so it was his first time fly fishing, and he's like, you know, I, I really want to catch a two footer today. And I was like, oh yeah, we'll 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 see what we can do. An hour into fishing the beaver head, he catches a twenty four inch fish. <laughs> <laughs> of course he does. So, you know, it was a big fight, you know, t- took at least 10 minutes to get it in the net, fighting it down river. Um, and we got it in the net and both of us are shaken with adrenaline <laughs> because I mean, it was, I saw the fish and I lost it. Um, anyway, so we got a bunch of pictures. Wait, so, so here's the question. I, this is, and maybe this is like a guide question, like how you work as a guide. So say you've got like a new angler or something like that. And you recognize, you're like, there is a freaking monster on the end of that line. Are you like, oh my gosh, you got a huge fish on there? Or are you like kind of playing it down being like, okay, you know, just keep calm, keep your rod up? Yes, I am definitely trying to keep calm while giving uh, very clear (laughs) and precise instructions because it hurts me just as bad as it hurts the client when that fish, if the fish breaks off or gets off or whatever. Uh, it's very devastating for everybody. So I'm trying to keep calm, tell them what to do, talk them through it. Um, there is an art to netting fish. Um, it's- I I am not an artist when it comes to that. I'm just throwing that out there. I'll have to take you. <laughs> yeah, <I'll> have to, <laughs> definitely. I, I'm, wow, I, I'm awkward when it when mm-hmm. it comes to netting fish. I I might look like I know what I'm doing sometimes when I fly fish, but definitely <laughs> not when I'm netting. There's there's no question. It's like a quick jab scoop. Exactly. I it's, it, me on the other hand, I'm like, hey. <laughs> you guys can't see you, you can't see how I'm gesturing right now, but it's trust me, it's awkward. It's pretty awkward. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway. Got the fish. I told him he's ruined um, on fly fishing forever. Pretty much. So, you know, we caught a lot of fish that day. We had a great day, but nothing compared to that first fish. <laughs> See, that's that's the rough thing. That's like the guy that goes out hunting for the first time and just like happens across like a Boone and Crockett buck yep. at, at like 20 yards and hammers it. And you're just like, you're never going to be satisfied with anything ever again. Yeah. Yeah, no, I totally get that. I shot a really big buck, I don't know, maybe four or five years ago. 
And I just really haven't had the desire to shoot one since. I mean, unless it's bigger, then I'll shoot it. But yeah. I'm like, you know, now I'm just, I'm kind of ruined on it. Well, I mean, it, it doesn't hurt that it, you guys can supply the meat pretty <laughs> consistently yeah, we, between you and Blade. Yes, definitely. So, you know, there's, it, you know, you're not sitting there concerned about like, oh, what are we going to do to fill the freezer this year? You know, walk out to the damn field and shoot one of those cows out there if we need to. Exactly. <laughs> yes, we have lots of cows. Um, but, you know, our deer that are on the ranch, they are delicious. They taste a lot like the cows because they're eating all the same stuff that the cows eat. Mm-hmm. So, you know, a whitetail on our well, place. When I, when I say cows, I was talking about the cow elk. That, like, oh, those two. Yeah. showed me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's just usually gonna, a few of those around. Walk out on the back porch with your rifle. <laughs> I might. Things are getting weird out there. I don't know. <laughs> Meat prices are crazy right now. Uh, and, that, and that one cow was looking at me funny that week. Mm-hmm. 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 Just eyeballing me. <laughs> now I remember. So you know a little bit of how we met. Um, you know, I was came came up for, after hunting season last year and was visiting some friends, and uh, we all ended up in. Uh, uh, I ended up meeting your husband blade and we end up sitting in a duck blind together and um then three days later i'm moving to montana <laughs> I mean, we'd always joke my family would always yeah. joke with me they're like you know because my trips to montana just kept getting longer and longer mm. and longer every time i'd visit like quote unquote visit and suddenly i'm like month-long trips now my family used to always joke they're like one of these days we're just gonna get a call that says hey i'm staying send me the dogs and that's, I mean, that's basically how it kind of happened. I mean, I went home and got him, but I right. called him up and was like, hey, guess what? <clears throat> Sorry, I've got a, got a beer here, and I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm trying not to burp right into the microphone. Um, <laughs> but so, you know, we got to, got to meet. We did, uh, I did some uh, waterfowling and some pheasant hunting yep. uh, with Blade and Josh and, and the whole crew. Um, and met you through your husband Yep. and we, we started talking a little bit about fly fishing cause I just picked it up. I just finally started seeing some success in fly fishing and, uh, and we sat down like, we need to record a podcast. Um, and so, and that was just after, you know, Blade had kind of taken me around the property and he's like, you want to see some cool shit? Yep. <laughs> and he's like. Just put your binoculars up over there. I'm like, holy crap! <laughs> There's elk everywhere. Everywhere. <laughs> no, that was a, that was a, that was a that was really cool to see. Then he showed me some some barbecued bald eagles. Um, that was not. We did not touch them. We did not right. commit any felonies. I'm Called just throwing the game that warden. out there. The game warden came yeah. out. He did the investigation. <laughs> Actually, <laughs> what he told me is like, hey, you want to go commit a felony? <laughs> we were joking. Joking. Please, <laughs> nobody send emails. He was joking. He was like, go pick that up. I'm like, I'm not touching shit. Yeah. <laughs> um, which is, that's a whole different weird. So I like, that's a wild thing. Like, you cannot even touch them. You can't. You can't pick up their feathers. Yeah, unless uh, the only one that's like authorized to have a fe- is like if you're gifted by a native chieftain or something. I right? didn't know that. That's from how I understand it, and I'm, I'll probably get emails. Was like I guess you can own the only way you can own a feather is if you're gifted by a native chiefman, chieftain, chiefman, and there. But there's like all kinds of paperwork, and they have what? to have gotten it. And so you can't just be like, oh yeah, I was gifted by you know chief yeah. whatever. Like, there's all this paperwork and stuff like that. Right. Because, um, yeah, that was that was, that was was one of the other wild things. We were looking at elk, and they were like, and there's a dead bald eagle. Holy crap. Yeah, I hate to say that it happens probably quite a bit. Well, he was telling me, he's like, yeah, it, it happens so many times. When After it's reported a few, this many times, then, like, the power company has to come out and, like, do something to the power lines in that area. Yep. Then it happens somewhere else, and they have to come out and... That's wild, but <laughs> ranch life, <laughs> ranch life. Yep. Um, but oh yeah, so we were talking about expectations and stuff. Um, you know, it's 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 funny. Like I've, you go out and you you want to shoot the biggest thing, but you're you're sitting here. You see <laughs> you see the deer I shot. <laughs> Is that a deer? <laughs> Everyone, it's it's most of a deer. It's it's very small. Okay. Um, 
But uh, that is a that is the first deer I shot. That is an, an Arizona mule deer. Um, that was the first tag I ever filled. And anybody that's been following along, been listening for the, for the past few years, knows the whole story. But I tell you what, my expectations were set low, not in a bad way. Right. I'm not saying it's a bad because like now I'm happy. I'm like, shoot, I shoot a I shoot a forky, and I'm like stepping it up. Like, I'm stoked. You shot something when I first met you, and it was rolling around in the back of your truck forever. That oh. Would, that would be... Okay. That would be my uh, my uh, Axis Sitka-looking elk here. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I could see I could see that. Yeah, that was, a, the, that was the very stinky head that was rolling around in the back of my truck, because yeah. I was just supposed to come up and visit Montana. I wasn't supposed to come up and be here for like a month and a half before, you know, like, so I had the, you know, I just shot my, my elk in right. Arizona. I didn't have time to get the, the head taken care of. And so I was like, okay, I'll just, you know, figure it out when I get a little settled, get it, drop it off somewhere. Yeah. Well, this trip took a lot longer than I expected, yep. and that head started stinking in the back of my truck. <laughs> <laughs> well, it looks great now. It looks better on the wall, mounted bleached than it did in the back of your truck yeah definitely and smells better definitely smells a a lot better um that was getting that was getting pretty rough for a while and then when i when i moved into this place i left it in the garage Mm. because i I called a landlord i'm like hey i know my lease doesn't start for another two weeks but can i just drop off the stuff that's in my truck right now and i put that head in there and it was rank i bet and i mean that thing was wrapped like i had it literally encased in salt i remember that yeah. And wrapped in so many layers of saran wrap yep. and trash bags. And it's still, <laughs> I mean, probably a little TMI. There was like maggots crawling out of the back of my truck. Oh, no. It was so disgusting. <laughs> it was so bad. That is bad. Uh, well, it looks good now. Yeah, no, it's, yeah, it's very pretty. Yeah. It's my elk. Got mm-hmm. the arrow there. Mm-hmm. So we're happy. <laughs> and again, low expectations. I shot myself a little raghorn. Yeah. As long as I, as long as I do. I'll be it this year. So here's my thing. This year. I've gotten so used to having meat in the freezer for the first time, like consistently. Right. That I'm kind of I'm kind of the opinion this year. Like I know I don't have as much time to hunt. I don't have as much opportunity because I'm moving. I'm like full on. If it's brown, it's down this year. Like, Absolutely. The first legal cow, whatever I see, it is. I'm punching that sucker with my rifle, and I'm calling it a day. And I think cows are better to eat. Mm-hmm. In my personal yeah. opinion, um, I think does are better to eat. Oh, I mean, I don't think anybody's going to argue with you with yeah. that because it's like my whole thing is like I like I like the experience. I mm-hmm. like to go chase them. Mm-hmm. The problem is this year, you know, we've had some discussions, a bunch of upheaval with jobs and business and all this yep. stuff. I'm dealing with all that. And then I'm dealing with health issues. And then now I'm in the middle of a move because, you know, I'm really smart in deciding to move in the middle of hunting season, <laughs> you know, in the middle of fall in Montana, where it's probably the second I start moving, it's going to be like, yeah, we're going to dump snow. Yep. Um, we need it, though. Oh, desperately need that need <laughs> that water. Um, but I'm kind of like, I don't have time to spend six weeks out hunting, you know, like right. investing four four or five days out of the week to being in the woods to being out hunting. So I'm like, you know what? I'm shooting the first damn legal thing I can see. I'm filling that freezer, saving the adventure for another year. Yep. But and and here's the other thing. I still got bear. I can still go predator hunt. I can, you know, I mean, and we've got shoulder seasons out here until like February. Right. And then I can uh, you know, and there, there's waterfowl till when does waterfowl end? Duck gumbo is really good. Mhm. Mhm. Like, when does waterfowl season end here? Is um, that, it's like sometime in the spring, isn't it? Almost. Let me Google it. I'd have to. Oh, it's not a big deal. Not a big deal. I'm it up. That's but, like, really it's, question. I mean, it's Montana. Mm-hmm. There is, there's maybe, like, three days out of the year where we're not, like, like there's something, something going on. Like, yeah, and, 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 like, that's something that's not, there's, like, yeah, like, a handful of weeks out of the year that there's something that's not just, like, a year-round hunt, like coyotes or whatever. There, I mean... There's so much opportunity. We have such long seasons here. Yep. And, uh, oh, man, it's so nice being a resident now. Oh, I <laughs> compared bet. Compared to those non-resident oh, yeah. tags. If you can even get a tag. I mean, the lottery oh, yeah. system is so, it's great. But there's so many people putting in, it's really hard to draw a tag. 
Okay, so here's a question for you, because, you know, you guys started uh, Montana Bucks and Ducks. Yep. You guys do outfitting. Yes. And there's recently been a lot of controversy around the different outfitter tag bills that have come up. And just, you know, honest opinion, I'd, I'd be curious for your views on, on, on how that came up and the tags that are available, because... You're a long-term Montana resident, right? But you're also an outfitter, so you, you yeah. know you kind of get both sides of it. And um, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd be I'd be curious. Yeah, no, I l- I would love that. to talk about it. Um, I think it's a lot of misinformation out there. I think people think that if outfitters get tags, that's going to take away from what they have on their public land. But for us, for example, we hunt on our ranch. It's not open to the public. It's too much of a liability. Um. So when our clients get these tags, they are bringing money into the community via the gas station, via the restaurants, um, and then just buying the tag alone. They're expensive. They are not cheap. Our Fish, Wildlife, and Park Services, they need this money. They need the revenue um, to make more public access, to make the public accesses that we have better, to make better habitat. So I... Even if I wasn't an outfitter, I only see the benefits to allotting outfitter tax. Here's the other problem. All the other Western states around us, the outfitters get tags. So if you're somebody from Texas and you want to go hunting in the West, you're going to go to Idaho where you can get a hold of an outfitter and that outfitter says, yep, I've got my tag right here. It's waiting for you. It's got your name on it. You don't have to wait and see if you get it, not get it. You don't have to deal with the lottery. I've got it right here. Let's plan your trip. This is as opposed to states where you have to first draw your tag and then apply to the outfitter. And then, you know, is the outfitter going to have time on their schedule or room for that then for you uh, versus, you go with the outfitter, you're guaranteed that specific tag. Yeah. And typically it's for their privately leased land that they Area. guide on. Yep. And even the public land um, outfitters in Idaho anyway, they, it, they're they not going to give out 100 tags to the outfitter. They, they do studies. How many animals can we shoot to keep this sustainable? So that's how many tags the outfitter gets. But in Montana, it's a total total crapshoot. So when we first started outfitting, there weren't a lot of people putting in for tags. So they never ran out in the state of Montana. But now we're seeing this crazy influx of people wanting to come hunting out here. So now it's becoming an issue where it was not an issue before. Um, So I mean, a lot of our clients, they don't draw their tags. So two years ago, um, we only had two people. That's it. Deer tags. That was it. And that's devastating to an outfitting business and operating on this lottery system where you don't know if you're going to be able to operate that year is insane. And, and the fact that we're expected to do it that way is also insane. Yeah. It's a, it's a tough thing. Cause the, you know, the, the, the part of me, the part of me that's like, everyone should be on the level playing field and this and that says one thing, but I do, I do definitely understand where you're coming from and especially, you know, bringing in those funds, being able to run a business and being able to consistently have clients is huge. Mm-hmm. Um and it's you know, it's it's tough. There's not there's not a great answer, there's not a great solution for any of it, uh, you know, unless somebody can magically bring back populations of elk and mule deer to what they, you know, were before <laughs> right. back in the back in the early 1800s. Yep. Like it's a it's a you know it's a difficult thing with a difficult solution. You know you've got here in Montana you like you've got a lot of people that are like you that are residents but are also guides and and yep. look at both sides and um and w- so what I I forget what ended up happening with with those bills where we're at. So we got some legislation passed where if you are going to hunt with an outfitter this year, you get an emergency, it's like an emergency outfitter assistant. So you do get a tag. We have to fill out a bunch of extra paperwork, the out of state um, client that's coming up. I think he has to pay a hundred extra dollars, more revenue for fish, wildlife and parks. Um, Going forward, I think it's kind of up in the air. Mm -hmm. Um, And I understand it was popular opinion that, and we voted it to get rid of outfitter tags. 
but things are changing. Like I said, when this first happened, it wasn't a big deal because whoever applied from out of state got a tag. We weren't overtapped. Now there's so many people. We have to revisit the situation. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's difficult. It's past, you know, I want to say three years. It's really has been getting difficult to get those tags out. You're used to be, you know, you could go, you could go to the store, you know, a month or two into the, into the season and go pick up, you know, an over the counter, yeah, over the counter tag. No problem. Um, as a, as a non-resident used to be, I mean, you could, you were pretty much guaranteed a, at least a, a general tag, a license, you know, right. And, and Montana's a little bit different and, you know, you know, most states are either like bonus points or preference points right. and they do this and Montana's, Uh-oh. Montana's kind of like, <laughs> we had, my dogs, my dogs are like so antsy right now and they are helping with the podcast. Um, they're, they're both jumping up, trying to be very social, um, you guys, you guys aren't podcast guests. I'm sorry. You're very cute, but you're not. Um, but you know, Montana's a little bit different. We've got so we've got licenses, which pretty much lets you hunt. And, you know, it depends on which license you you get the sportsman's license, you get this, that, the other, whatever. Right. But that pretty much lets you hunt across a good chunk of the state. Mm-hmm. And then the draws now now for non residents, it's a draw because because of the demand. Yep. We're still guaranteed licenses, pretty much. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 If you're a resident. Yeah. Like that. <laughs> not encouraging anyone to move here because we're full. Yeah. Um, I'm. I'm the last one. I took up the last spot. So, uh, <laughs> you know, it's. I tell you what, it's expensive to hunt here in Montana, but we do reap the benefits of it as residents. Yeah, I mean, it's huge for these small towns. Uh, you know, I'm from a small town in Dillon, and hunting mm-hmm. is a huge economic factor i mean i think fishing is a little bit more so because the season is longer but yeah. um both keep these you know little towns alive it's it, it, we definitely reap the benefits out here of those non-residents honey and that's that's one of the things i laugh because there's a balance there's so many people here that are you know and it's a lot of the old guard that you know go down with the ship like, oh, you know, effing out of staters coming out here. I just wish we could get rid of all of them. I'm like, okay, you got rid of all of those out of staters who are dropping twelve hundred plus dollars solely on a tag on a on a elk and mule deer tag, general tag. Yep. Extra if they're getting a permit, if they're getting a bear tag, if they're getting this, if they're gonna go fishing with it. Like yep. suddenly, you know, by the time all said and done with travel expenses and, and food and this and that, they've dropped five grand into the you know, per person into the, into Montana's economy and these small town economies. Um, stuck in the my dogs are like <laughs> unplugging all the stuff for my computer right now. And it's amazing. I think I unplugged your Alexa. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, she's still talking. Oh good. There we go. She's upside down. She's got her face in the dirt. <laughs> but oh, like, I'm like, okay, so you take that away. Suddenly your grocery prices are going to start going up. Yep. It, suddenly your gas prices are going to start going up. Guess what else is going to go up? Your tag prices are going to double, triple, quadruple. When you don't have somebody paying 1200 bucks for those tags, yeah. you know, I mean, I can't even tell you. I think I just, you know, you just bulk by when you live here, you just bulk by like you go down the list and check, 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 yep. purchase. You drop your like 250 bucks that it costs and call it a day. Um, You know, that's, that's not going to be as cheap or as comfortable. Yeah. And, and you know, some people are just never going to be happy. Um, I agree. Yeah. I've been paying pretty close attention. I've listened to both sides and I, I do understand, but I, oh. I really do. Um, but it's something that has to be addressed and it's being addressed now. Oh yeah. So, and it's, again, it's, it's a balance. It's it's yeah. like as long as everyone's a little bit unhappy, we're in a good mm-hmm. spot, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, you don't want anyone a lot unhappy. No. But you're never you're never going to make it. Yeah, you're never going to get people like cuz what people here want is I want to pay $60 for all my tags and never see anyone in the woods when I go out. Yeah, that's not. Those days are over. Guess what? <laughs> <laughs> you're going to need a time machine for that shit. Yes. It's just yes. not going to happen. And, um some, and I think COVID uh, has changed a lot of that. Oh, it, it, without a doubt. I mean, the yep. surge, surge we've seen, and I've talked about this once or twice, like, it's a big question. It's like, over the next year, 
a, we've seen these surges over the past kind of two, three years. Is it going to continue or are we going to see all these people drop off and kind of lose interest? Are we going to see know. people that are buying tags and, and just not going out into the woods that it's, it's hard to, it's hard to predict what's going to happen with this. And and who knows what's going to happen with the government? Like, are lockdowns going to continue? If so, yeah, we'll probably see more people in the woods again. Yep. And more dumb people that probably shouldn't be carrying rifles. <laughs> like, I mean, I am all about... We've, you know, we talk, I'm all yeah. about new hunters. Right. I love that. But I'm also all about not shooting people. It happens <laughs> every year. Every year. Be careful, year. people. Wear your orange. Oh, yeah. Oh yeah, and I mean I I I'm a consummate archery hunter. That's what I love. That's what I'm passionate about. Yep. Um, and so you know I, I don't wear my orange when it's archery season, but right. damn the second the second that thing shifts. Yep. I am I am head to toe pumpkin. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> for sure. I, carrying around an orange flag waving behind <laughs> me that says like, "Don't shoot me." Yes. Um. Because there is a lot of inexperienced people, and I, again, I believe, I'm a firm believer that you should find a way to get out. Don't, like, pressure yourself into having to become perfect and learn everything. Get out in the woods. But a few things you do need to learn are how not to shoot people and commit felonies. Um, And also, when you're fishing, please, please give people space. Oh, dear Lord, yes. (laughs) That's been a huge thing this year. I'll just be standing somewhere and somebody, I'll look over and someone's right next to me. I'm like, what you, what, how'd you get here? <laughs> so, like, that's, you know, that's one thing. Gosh, I love being out here. I, my yeah. fly fishing equipment never leaves my truck. My whole backseat of my truck, it's I've got both fly rods, my wading belt, my sling pack, my waders, my boots, a couple of changes of clothes. <laughs> like, nice. Just... It all exists back there Good. because that's one of the amazing things about Montana. You can't drive anywhere, anywhere without, oh, look, fishing access point. Yep. I got an extra two hours. Like, let me get over and it may be garbage fishing. It's still fun. I mean, it, there's no bad time to cast a line in the water. No, no, no I just... agree with that. Although this year with all the closures, it was kind of tough. The fishing closures. Yeah. Um, the big hole is still basically pretty much all shut down to fishing, which is my personal favorite river in Montana. Um, it's hard to see it go through this drought. Um, I hope that the new regulations they put in um, will help our brown trout populations. Catch and release only. Mm-hmm. Um, they're going to close a lot of the river to fishing starting November 1st. So if you are going to fish the big hole this year, there's some new regs, uh, new regulations that just went into a Effect uh, August, like mid August, end of August. Okay. So just be aware of that. Um, you know, if you like going down there and fishing worms, that's awesome. But some sections are closed to live bait, so they're just trying to bring those brown trout yeah. populations back, trying to make sure that they survive this drought. And hopefully next year is a different story. We have lots of water. It doesn't get as hot, and everything goes back to normal. Well, you know, and, and here's knock on wood. Like I'm. I'm big farmer's almanac person, like the world goes mm. through phases, all of that stuff. And mm-hmm. I get I get messages from my mom all the time. Oh, she's like, she's like, guess what? Guess what about this year, about the weather, this and that. She's like, I've been reading Farmer's Almanac. And uh and she was saying she was telling me apparently this year we're supposed to have a pretty solid winter. Good. Um and <laughs> which I am I, <laughs> I am the biggest hypocrite on earth. I am the biggest hypocrite on earth. I am like the most go back to California person. <laughs> oh my god! I actually okay. So, I mean, you know, Facebook. Like yeah. Facebook is what it is. I follow uh, Greg Gianforte on on Facebook. Oh yeah. I uh, follow the governor on Facebook, and you know how Facebook is. He'll post something about like. Look, I'm here to, you know, I'm just here showing some love to our, our first responders, our, our firemen, you know, just wanted to recognize the, the work they do. Just a nice, like, it's a PR picture. We all know what it is. Right. Dear Lord. There's, there'll be like three people, like, yeah, I love our governor. And then like everyone else is like, oh, but you let nine people die of COVID and why do you hate, 
why do you hate the elderly and oh, oh you're a piece of garbage and this and that and i oh my gosh i normally ignore it i just ignore that stuff i was i was out i was waiting for someone and i was just in a mood it's <laughs> i full-on told someone to go back to california okay i've got a i've got a story for you okay my dad is from california so i feel like i can like say some things like I, you know it's, it's not as bad but <laughs> so I hiked up to a high mountain lake um, in the Pioneer Mountain Range um, two days ago, and I saw something at the end of the lake. We thought it was a moose, because there's a lot of moose up there. So we're looking at it, and it's pretty far away. And I'm looking at it, I'm like, oh, that's definitely not a moose. And then it starts running, and it's a bear. (laughs) And so it was, A, the biggest black bear I have ever seen in my entire life, or B, a grizzly bear. Okay. My worst nightmares, like, like, so, you know, we're like super vigilant. We're, you know, we have our, our pistols ready, like still fishing, but just very vigilant. I have my dog with me. (laughs) Significantly more aware than you were about five minutes prior. Exactly. Um, so this younger couple comes by us and we're like, Hey, be careful walking that way. We think we just saw a bear and there are a lot of grizzly bears in that area Mm -hmm. that have moved in. So, you know, just be careful walking over there. And the couple says, oh, yeah, we saw it. We're going over there to check it out. Oh, my god! And I looked at him. I said, so what part of California are you from? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and don't get me wrong. Like, I, I love bears. I love right. watching bears. And, like, I want to get that vantage. But that is <laughs> like, that is, That's oh, dumb. Yeah, we're going over there. Oh, my god! And like I said, it could have been a grizzly bear, which I do not mess around with grizzly bears. Black bears, whatever, you know, they're pretty harmless most of the time. Grizzly bears, that's a whole other thing. I, no. There's a, I just recorded a podcast. Um, I think it'll come out, I think, I don't know, it'll probably come out a, a week or two prior to this one um, with uh, Tana Grenda, my dog sitting there hacking up something on my floor, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> oh, Oh, he's Dear Lord, uh, she—that's what—that's what she gets for like licking things off the floor. <laughs> she was she was eating random things found under my desk. Probably I'm have to give her the Heimlich. Uh, probably eight hundred year old Cheez-Its or something. Um, <laughs> anyway, so I was, I was doing this interview with um, uh, Tana Grenda, and uh, she lives up in Alaska with her husband, and uh, she and her brother this uh, not that long ago, I think it was spring season, went out for a grizzly hunt and it was the two of them and literally came a hair's breadth away from being mauled to death by a grizzly like it'd be a bad way to go it was just you know they anybody that's been listening has listened to the story if you haven't go listen go back and listen to it but it's just i mean put three rifle rounds into the dang thing Mm -hmm. then the rifle jams they proceed to put like four more pistol rounds in it before it it decides it's wounded enough to like saunter off and die in peace. Like it was, you know, they had it like lumbering after them. They were like hidden behind like a little, it's, it is a, I was, I felt tired after listening to this story. It was so intense. Like I needed to take like a nap. Oh my gosh. I have to listen to it. So you don't fuck with grizzly or brown bears. No, just don't do it. Don't do it. And well, and that's the thing. And the brown bears up in Alaska are not normally aggressive. Okay. They're not normally like the type that are going to come after you because they don't encounter people as much. They, you know, they're not used to people as much as say like the grizzlies out here are. Um, and the grizzlies, I mean, our percentage, our population of hunters is a lot bigger than it is up in Alaska. Like just right. the the density of people that are out hunting is a, is a lot bigger. And so they're a lot more used to, like, when hunters are out, there's going to be food around. And you just, like, I don't sit, like, a lot of people, you know, the first question a lot of people ask whenever I talk, talk about hunting or being out in the woods, are like, well, aren't you afraid of bears? And I'm like, yes and no. I'm like, no, not really. Like, I don't go out and worry about bears, but I'm always very cognizant of them. Grizzly bears freak me out a little bit. Uh, but grizzlies, yeah, are kind of... Again, mm. uh, they are a whole different... We can hunt black bears. They have a healthy fear of people. Grizzly bears have no fear of people mm-hmm. because they don't have to. So that's another thing. I think we should have a grizzly bear season. I'm probably going to get death oh, threats geez. in my DMs um, yeah. for saying that. But 
It's true. It needs to happen. There's too many. They're overpopulated. They're doing fantastic. Oh, they're way beyond yeah. repopulation goals. And I forget, I forget. I know Wyoming did their, they started Grizzly Hunt. I can't remember if that got canceled or not. I think, no, I don't think, I think it, I don't I, think they were able to go through with that. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I can't quite remember There's that. some judge that blocked it. I want to say the judge was from Missoula. Yeah, probably. Uh-huh. Dear Lord, Missoula and Missoula and Gallatin, the last two counties to remove mask mandates, and albeit here's here's my thing with the mad. I'm going way off on the tangent here. Um, with the mask mandates, like Gallatin was even Missoula lifted them before Gallatin did. I'm pretty really? sure. Really? Yeah. That's Gallatin was the last county, and they were holding on. And I'm almost glad because it was so great. To see everyone just saying F it and giving the middle finger to the mandates and just stopping wearing them. I went into the Belgrade DMV and I was like, and I kind of walked in. I was like, do I need to put this on? I'm like, oh, don't bother. None of them had mad. I mean, I, I hope I don't get anyone fired. Yeah, uh, like right. it was just, it was so great. And I was like, it was great to see people standing up to this bullshit. Right. And I'm just like. Anyway, that's a whole different tangent that I could talk about oh, COVID all day. Man, we definitely <laughs> I feel like if we go too much deeper, that's gonna be the rest of this podcast. Right, but right. Uh, so tell us a little bit about uh you know, we we've talked a little bit about fly fishing. Yep. Um you do well, do you guys do guiding fly fishing guiding through Montana Bucks and Ducks too? Negative. So I don't know how detailed I want to go into this. It's very complicated. Board of Outfitters um, regulates guides and outfitters very heavily. So I am a guide. I'm an independent contractor. I can guide for outfitters, but I cannot book my own trips because I am not an outfitter. Okay. So lucky for me, I work with a ton of fantastic outfitters um, out of Dillon, Montana, Twin Bridges, Montana. So if I have somebody who wants to hunt with me, we book through my outfitter. I take you out fishing we have a great time um but it's very so montana bucks and ducks is just hunting for now that could that could totally okay. change in the future but and so i actually uh i, I reached out to you the other day and i uh, hopefully sending a guy your way i'm i'm hoping he reaches out to awesome. blade to go do a pheasant hunt yep um so what uh what do you guys guide through montana bucks and ducks so montana bucks and ducks is basically um everything antelope elk white-tailed deer that's kind of our main thing because we have such a great healthy population we manage it they're beautiful they're awesome um and then we also do pheasants and ducks so you know the duck season is nice in pheasant season because it lasts so much longer Mm -hmm. you know rifle season is about a month long here um so you know it's like cramming a lot of a lot of people in pretty quick trying to trying to get animals um we're usually pretty successful, knock on wood. I don't want to. <laughs> um, and, you know, it's a lot of fun. We've done a lot of TV shows um, for the Outdoor Channel. We get to take out a lot of famous people, which is cool. And that's just all um, from great management on our end. We shoot the right bucks. We have we have mm-hmm. great bucks. We have a lot of feed for them. They're all doing well. Um, the mule deer in our area have been suffering a little bit. We don't shoot as many mule deer as we used to. But the whitetail have kind of taken over. Yeah, it's, you know, it's the muleys just, I don't think are doing that great. They're anyway. not very smart. They're my personal favorite. I, oh, love, I love them to death. Um, I, if I, if I had the choice between a mule deer hunt and a whitetail hunt, I would pick mule deer all day long, but they're not that smart. Oh, they're dumb. As far as deer go, they're dumb as a sack of hammers. I mean, like, <laughs> right. I, you know, I think anyone who's hunting for a while knows the whole, like, you spook a mule deer, you just wait five seconds till it like decides to stop and look back to you, back at you and figure out what it is. Exactly. And you can shoot it. Yep. Like, yes. <laughs> versus a white tail, like you spook that thing, it's gone. Yeah. Like you're never seeing that sucker again. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, you know, luckily for us, we've got a pretty big ranch. We've got a lot of acreage, um, but they, they're kind of there. They're mm-hmm. residents. They stay there. So we'll try our hardest to find them again. You know, if there's one you really like, you see them. It sounds like high fence, but it's not high fence. I promise. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, we've just. I mean, I mean, they're just they're animals, and they're going to hang out where the right. the feed is available. Like, yep. yep. And you're not, and you're not 
driving four wheelers like through the middle of them. Either. Oh no, 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 no. And so we do a lot of work with um, Montana wounded warriors, getting people out hunting. And then we also work with a few different foundations. So one in particular is the outdoor adventure foundation and they will take, um, they basically, basically sponsor a kid to go hunting who has like a terminal illness, not necessarily cancer, but, okay, and maybe it's not terminal. Um, but kids who have gone through a lot. So, you know, there's one kid, um, he was 12 and, um, we took him out on a hay wagon to shoot, shoot his first last and only elk. He shot his elk and then he passed away a couple months later. Mm. So, you know, we, we try to give back to the hunting community any way we can. If we can make it easier for these people to go out and harvest an animal, we will do anything to make it possible for them. Um, which is, you know, one of the benefits that we have and we love doing it. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, that's, it's so important. It's because you look at a lot of these programs too, for kids that are, you know, that are supposed to help terminal kids. And that's the one thing they won't do that they refuse to do is, uh, is hunts like the, uh, make a wish will not do anything to do with hunting. They refuse. Um, which is, it just seems like that just irritates the shit out of me. Cause it seems like so politically driven kind of like, it's like, if you were really about making the kids happy, you would be, you would have no issue with going out and doing, doing this, but it's yep. like that again, I could go on a whole diet oh, yeah. about that with no problem. Yep. But programs like that are so awesome. And, um, there's that one, there's, there's one, um, and I'm I'm blanking on the name of it. There's another one I did uh, I did in an episode with Donnie Drake back in the day, um, and it was a very similar style program where they take kids out for a hunt for you know for their 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 wish, um, and it's gonna bug the crap out of me that I can't remember the name of the pro uh, the program either. And I think they just changed their name too, and that's why I'm a little out of it. But no programs like that are amazing. Um, so uh, if Folks want to find Montana Bucks and Ducks, and they uh, and I and I will. Um, I, it wasn't officially Montana Bucks and Ducks at the time. Uh, that was I think you guys started that up just after I hunted with uh, hunted with Blade. So what happened was is um, our outfitter, my mentor, his name's Bill Kemp, got me started guiding, um, got Blade into hunting guiding. Uh, he let us operate underneath his license, basically. Well, he's ready to retire. So he came to us and said, hey, buy this business from me. You guys are set up to make it super successful. So we bought it just this last spring. And so we've taken over. So far, so good. It's still pretty early in the season. <laughs> well, and, and all I got to say is, you know, with Blade there, I got my, my first I, – I still haven't gotten a duck. There was just way – there was nothing but Canada's when we were – Oh, really? Well, in. that'll happen. There was a lot of them. Right. There was a lot of them. I got, I got a limit of Canada's. You know, I got – I limited my pheasants uh, when I went out. And so I will highly recommend – Oh, good. – y'all book with <laughs> with Blade and Kara. I'm yes. just saying – um, so if folks want to find Montana bucks and ducks, where are they headed? So I love our website. We just totally redid it. Um, it's MT. Hold on. Let me, I just looked it up. I you feel did. like I should know it, but my... MT. Okay. MT bucks and ducks.com. And it's A N D it's fully spelled out. Yes. Bucks and ducks. But yeah. MT bucks and ducks.com. There you go. So make sure y'all check out Montana bucks and ducks. If you want to come out and, and again, that's the cool thing about Montana. You can come out for a deer hunt and then you can, if you tag out, you can spend the rest of your time waterfowling yep. or upland game hunting or um, fishing, fishing. You yeah. can call, pre like, I mean, yeah. you can go find somewhere and throw out a fox bro and call some predators if you want. Like, yep. there's so many opportunities in this state. Um, and it's just, it's the best place on earth. I'm... I will fight anyone that says different. I agree. Um, <laughs> I, I've had some people who are like, well, have you ever been? I'm like, it does not matter. I'm like, I've traveled a lot of places in this world. Right. Montana is the best place on earth. But if I had to move from Montana, kicked out, couldn't stay here anymore. Okay. Wyoming. Really? Yeah. Wyoming. I would choose Alaska. I would do Alaska. It's a little, little remote. 
I it, mean, it's fine. Well, I also don't like people. <laughs> I <laughs> oh, just like, well. Again, we've discussed right. where I'm moving, I was right? Say, Haver, Montana is a perfect place for you. Yeah, I am like, <laughs> and I'm not even moving to Haver. I'm moving to like 40 miles north of Haver. I'm, I, we've had it. I'm closer to more Canadians than I am. Any Canadian girls up there? Yeah, oh, <laughs> <laughs> Trying to set me up on my own podcast. Yes. What is this? Yes. What is this? Uh, <laughs> so Montana Bucks and Ducks isn't the only thing you've got going on. No, I definitely not. So anything outdoors, fishing or hunting specifically, I'm super passionate about. Um, so one thing that I started uh, the spring of 2019 is called Yellow Sally. It's fly fishing clothing for women specifically and girls, which is was kind of an afterthought. But once I started, you know, thinking like, wow, there are no companies out there who make fishing clothing for girls. Um, it kind of took off. You know, Instagram, I love social media. I use it for good and not evil. <laughs> um, I absolutely love it. So, you know, I connected with um, girls all over the country, all over the world, who are like, wow, we are being recognized in this in this industry, where previously they have not. So, um, so I'm sizing for all. That was another thing I wanted to do, whether it's an extra small or a 3X. I typically have your size if not message me i'll make it happen um but yellow sally is it's been amazing i've made a lot of connections um i love wearing the clothing and like my thought going into it was well you know maybe it won't work out but at least i'll have my own cute clothing to wear yeah and don't get me wrong i love the companies that are out there they've been super supportive of me but they release one or two fishing shirts a year and all of us girls are wearing the exact same shirt and i'm like that's not me like i'm you know that's just not me so um you know my my patterns are bright they're crazy they're they're different which is the whole point um also you know inspiring more women to get into the sport which in 2020 has totally exploded Mm -hmm. women are interested they're taking classes they're coming fishing with me they're you know buying stuff for the store from the store which is awesome i really appreciate it um, but it's it's totally taken off, and I'm super grateful for it. Well, and it's I I love the stuff you put out. And it's I I think you have I think you have like some men's board shorts or something. That's I about have it. okay. I felt a little bit guilty that I didn't have anything for my husband, <laughs> so I made um, men's swimming britches, as I call them, but uh, swim trunks. I gu- yeah, I was gonna say they're not like the full length board shorts or anything. No, no, no. Swim- uh, there, there are them swimming britches. Swimming britches. Swimming uh, britches. Brown trout pattern. Those have been a pretty big seller, but I think women see them and they're like, oh my gosh, my husband who fishes exactly. has, has everything. He's got all the nice stuff. I'm going to get him a pair of brown trout swimming shorts. It's it's one of those things. It's like, I'm a fan of cutties. I'm not a fan of brown trout. Like, <laughs> cutthroat. I, I don't know what it is about cutthroats. I think it's when I first heard the story of cutthroats. And then also... When I when I learned why they're called cutthroats, I always had like, do you ever hear a name for like the the kind of colloquial name for an animal, and you're like, you kind of come up with a reason in your head why it's named that, and that for cutthroats for me, I thought it was like because it was like this aggressive form of trout. I'm like, no, I mean like, they are, <laughs> they are, but no, they've got like red slits on their throat, like is, right. And I just, I think that just, I was like, that like blew my mind or something when I first you heard that. You know what that. would really mm. blow your mind? What's that? Have you caught a cut bow? Um, I do not believe so. I That'll do blow your mind. not believe I've caught a cut bow. So beautiful like a rainbow mm-hmm. and then just those red slits underneath. See, though, know, like, I feel like a lot of the West Slope cutties I've caught up here have had some just beautiful colors on them. Because there's been a couple of times I've caught, I, I was like, is that a rainbow? And then I, I, so maybe I have caught a couple of cut bows. Right. Um, But I know I'm pretty sure most of the, most of what I've caught up here has been up uh, in the tobacco roots. Mm. Um, well, remember we were talking, I'd, I'd message him like, I need a place to just get, that. like, I'm having a bad time right now. I need to get to the water somewhere. Where can I just disappear for a couple of days? And um, I, you know, I was researching some places. I ended, ended up in the tobacco roots and uh, 
I probably shouldn't say this, but I was up at the Sure Shot Lakes, and I, because right now, right now it's kind of a, my place. Not too many people go up there, at least okay. to where I go. Um, but uh, the Sure Shot Lakes up in Tobacco Roots, about an hour and a half from to get there from Bozeman, and you can just drive right up to the lakes, and you can park there and set up camp, and you're not gonna, it's not, you're not gonna be pulling them out every five minutes, and they're not gonna be big. But I caught probably the last weekend I was there, I probably caught like six to ten. Hmm. I mean, anywhere from six inch to six inch to ten inch cutties. And they were just big enough to recognize they were fish on either side of my hand. Yeah. <laughs> that was about it. It's still fun, though. Oh, yeah. So I heard this quote and I try to it's hard when you're guiding, but I try to live by this. But the best fly fisherman is the one who has the most fun. Oh, I guarantee that's me every single time. I'm and see here. I'm I'm also the guy, and I've, I've I talked to somebody about this. Like, I'm not the stoic fly fisherman. Yeah, I'm the guy. Like, I get one on the hook. I'm like, yeah, let's get her in. Like, I'm yelling at my buddies. I'm like, screaming. I got yeah. one. I'm like the guy that if if there's other people on the river, they're like, ah. <laughs> <laughs> Like that guy just needs to tone it down. Just, a little bit. Yeah. I'm yep. like, what? I've got like a four inch fish on, on my hook, and I'm like, yeah, motherfuckers, what's up? <laughs> well, I think people probably look at you weird when you drop the f bomb, and their kids <laughs> are there. Like, yeah. Well. <laughs> so good, bitches. <laughs> right. There's a ten year old kid on that boat. <laughs> yep. Yep. I'm, I I take out some kids on the river. I'll be just putting my hands over their ears. <laughs> earmuffs <laughs> earmuffs oh dear lord sam's on that boat and yep. he's got he's got a fish on the oh, line gosh. earmuffs <laughs> do you ever watch the hank patterson videos on youtube i don't think i have you need to watch some hank patterson videos tonight when i leave okay okay really funny i will make sure i will make sure to link link to some of those on the show notes page so as well. when he catches a fish he'll yell something like <laughs> Hot dog, <laughs> backpack, or like, you know, so something specific to him. So everybody on the river knows that it's him that caught the fish. Oh, funny. Yeah. Well, it's kind of a spook, but it's hilarious. Oh, you got to oh, watch okay. it. Yeah. The names, I feel like somebody's told me about them before. Like well, I, some of mm. my fly fishing friends have told me about it before. The name sounds really familiar. You will laugh very hard. But I have a, do you know, um, uh, he goes by huge fly fisherman. I have a sticker. Yep. <laughs> yep. So I met him in Colorado. So when I was coming oh. up just before coming to see you guys. Okay. Um, I, I was uh, fishing with a friend in Colorado and I had somebody else that I'd recorded a podcast with say, hey, you have to talk to this guy. And I saw he was in Colorado. I'm like, hey, you want to grab a beer? So we meet up and he and we just connected. And he's like, hey, can you be in, can you be in northern Utah in two days? I'm like. Yeah, he's like, all right, you're coming on a float trip with me. Oh, that's awesome. And I'm like, sweet. And so I had a, and you want to talk about like weird dudes on the river. <laughs> like, you've probably seen his videos. Like, yep. oh my God. Like, I, I will say that is the first time I've ever added a bare ass to my uh, podcast covers. Um, <laughs> that is, the whole, he holds the the distinction of being the one and only bare ass on a podcast cover that I've ever promoted. So that's awesome. There's that. Um, yeah, I have his sticker on my cooler and some of my clients that see it, they get it. They're like, that's funny. I'm a huge fly, sh- fly fisherman. That's hilarious. And some of them are like, so you think you're like a huge fly fisherman or what? I'm like, it's <laughs> facetious. Like it, it's supposed to be funny. I bet. I bet you're uh, a lot of fun at parties, aren't you? You're right. <laughs> oh, yeah. You know, it's just with some things. Some people sometimes forget hunting and fishing is supposed to be fun. Yes. And don't get me like there's a serious aspect to it. Like especially with hunting and, and like you want to have respect for the animals and the game and and. There's an art to it and a talent with fly fishing and this. And then there's so much to it. But why the hell are you out there if you're not having fun? I don't know. And I mean, I've caught myself. There's days where like I'll go out and I get focused on the wrong things. Like especially with fly fishing. Like I get focused on the wrong stuff and I stop having fun. And I sit there and I like try and force it. And I, it like puts me in a bad mood. And I'm like, that is the last thing I want to do with fly fishing. Yep. Beer helps with that, by the way. 
this is true. <laughs> See though, like I'll do I'll do beer when it gets a little bit colder, but like I'll admit when I'm when I'm in like a nice little high of hunt stream, you know, it's sunny, it's warm, I'm fly fishing. I drink a lot of white claws when I'm fly fishing. Yeah, white claws are delicious. Oh, there's I mean <laughs> It's just so perfect, like when it's warm and yeah. it's refreshing, yeah. and you got a nice little buzz going. Yep. And I'm, I'm probably going to get more emails about this than we did about the other the other controversial stuff we talked about. I feel like we've covered a lot of controversial stuff today. We have white claws and and alfred kegs, <laughs> <laughs> COVID. I don't know. I feel like we can all agree, even if you don't admit it to yourself. White claws are delicious. They are refreshing. Yes. And delicious. They're low calories. Low calories and low carb. They've got keto. Higher alcohol content than a, <laughs> than a Coors Light. It's true. <laughs> Speaking of which, I think we're running low on beer. I was going to say do we need do we need to pause this for a second yep. and refresh? Pause it. All right, let's pause. Right. This is a great place for an advertisement. You know, we just uh, we just got back. We got another beer running. We're on a completely different topic now. We're talking we're talking hunting dogs because uh, I'm moving up to uh, uh, BFE or BFN, depending on where you're from. Uh, BFE or BFN, Montana, up ten minutes from the Canadian border, in the middle of a bunch of wheat fields, but has lots of great upland game hunting, lots of pheasant hunting, and. Um, but so we're talking hunt dogs, and I, you know, I got my two pretty aggressive hunting, uh, hunting dogs. You know, <laughs> they, they, they have scared away their fair share of turkeys. I will say, really, you know, they're, that surprises me. They, they've chased many a turkey in the backyard, but uh, no, they. Uh, we were talking, I. I love GSPs. You were talking about the wire hairs. I love. Yep. I personally love GSPs, and I think that's just because I was introduced to the sweetest GSPs on earth. Like I would stay at my buddy's place, I'd fall asleep, I'd wake up, and they would. I would wake up not being able to breathe because I would have two enormous German short-haired pointers laying across one across my face and one across my chest, like they were. That has not been my experience. I have the complete opposite experience. I'm like, come over here and cuddle me, dog. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like pet. I'm like petting them, and you can tell they just hate it. And I'm like, why? Why don't you want to be petted? Well, and that's my thing with like working dogs. Like, I would, I want to have like some hunting dogs that. But you, I feel like you've kind of got the the two categories of hunting dogs. You've got like the the waterfowl and upland game dogs, and then you've got like the bloodhounds, the tracking dogs, right. the the hog dog. Yep. Those dogs are tools. They're treated well. Like I'm mm-hmm. not, and I'm not. This is not me being down on anyone at all. But like hounds and stuff like that that people use for that kind of hunting, those dogs are tools. Right. They are not. They're not pets. They're, you know, they're, they're kept in their own kennels and this and that and separate. I feel like a, most people, like there's exceptions, but most people I know that have retrievers for waterfowl or for upland game, you know, or dogs for running upland game, whatever it is, those dogs sleep in the bed with those people. Right. Like. <laughs> so we have a golden retriever right now um, for our hunting and he, I think he struggles with being a hunting dog and being a family dog. I feel like he's kind of torn what he really wants to do because when we're out hunting, he'll, you know, have his nose to a ground, the ground, he'll flush a bird and he'll retrieve it. But then he wants to like come back and be right next to you. Yeah. So he's a fantastic dog. Um, We definitely need to get more labs in the future um, just for ducks. Well, I don't know. I don't know what the mix is. I meant to tell you this earlier. I don't know what the mix is, but... Uh, my sister's, um, my sister's lab, uh, well, let's just say, uh, she was a little bit, a little bit of a hoe. Uh Oh, <laughs> and, uh, so suddenly there's a lot of puppies to be had. Um, I'm not sure what the mix is or what it is, but I can always ask cause is the dad a hunting dog? They're looking probably not. Um, <laughs> 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 They're they're looking to they got a few extra puppies and I was even yeah. looking I'm like they're so cute. Aww. I want to I always tell people so like I've got I'm getting you know going to be living on seven acres. Have you ever seen secondhand the movie Secondhand Lions? 
Do you remember? That? It's like it's Robert Duvall, mm. Haley Joel Osment. I can't. Oh, I'm blanking on the other actor. So it's about no. these two crazy uncles. Their nephew comes to live with them. Whatever. But on their property, they got a bunch of property. On their property, they've got this like random assortment of dogs that just runs around. And I think it's a bunch of dogs and a pig. And they all just run around together in a pack. And it's like this whole mix of like random dogs. I just want to have a giant pack of random ass dogs all over my property. Like it just like like 10 or 12 of them. And I want to have a couple of GSPs for yeah. Upland Game and for yep. Waterfowl and Retrieving and all that stuff. But... I just want a, I just want to like rescue all the dogs in the local shelter, bring them to my property and 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 just and have like a crazy weird so like when people come up there's like 14 dogs <laughs> like every every movie about like some city person going into the country that you've ever seen. Like when okay. they when they first pull into the driveway and like all the 80 dogs yeah. are like jumping up on the car. That's what I want. I just don't want to see you on hoarders. <laughs> I will not be on hoarders, dear Lord. I will. I, I've been good at this struggle, but I've been good at this shit. But um, you may see me on Crazy Dog People. Okay, that, uh, well, if, that's if that right. becomes a TV show, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So with hunting dogs, like what? What do you look for uh, when it comes to hunting dogs? Because you do a mix of of both upland game and waterfowl, and um. So I'm still trying to find that perfect dog. I love goldens. They're so beautiful. They're just such great family dogs. But my perfect dog, I think, would be a small female yellow lab. Okay. She could do it all. She could do the pheasant. She could do the duck. She could be a great companion. She can sleep in bed with you. She can get in the truck. Um, That would, for what we do, that would be ideal. But I also want a wire hair to point and then I want a flushing dog to come up and flush the dog. And I love flushing dogs. They're amazing. But when you have those two working together, you get a closer shot to whatever mm-hmm. you're hunting, which is awesome. Well, it was cool. Like, I had never, prior to this year, I'd never done any upland game. I'd never done any waterfowl. Like, this was all a brand new experience to me. And watching watching the dogs work is, is amazing. The coolest yeah. thing ever. I agree. And like, you know, we sat we did the waterfowl for quite a while and, you know, watching, uh, watching the dogs, you know, they'd be, and I, that's my favorite thing is they'd be dead asleep. And then the second they hear you flick that safety off, the, they are like up and they're shaking. Ready. They are so just like amped to get out there and, yep. and chase something. Ready to party. And then watching them, Canadian geese are not small animals. Like, I mean, yeah, they're no elk or anything, but... Packing them into the blind. Oh, they're a hefty animal. And watching watching the dogs, like, lift one of those, uh, or two of them sometimes, yeah. and, like, drag them back. That's so impressive. But then hopping over to the pheasant hunt and watching, watching the dogs go nonstop through as you're doing a drive in front of you. Literally nonstop for like half an hour as you're walking up this field and they're going back and forth and flushing. Yep. Nose to the ground. That was so cool to watch. Okay. Quick question. When you were um, duck hunting or when you shot the geese, they're, usually, you know, the dogs will bring them in the blind. You wait. Mm-hmm. Did you have one come alive again in the blind? So there was one. <laughs> well, there's a couple that kind of like flip their shit in the blind. Like there's a couple that are flapping around a little bunch in the blind. <sighs> but there was one. One of the, like, the dogs brought it back, and I can't remember exactly what happened, but effectively, I think the dogs may have been, like, trying to, uh, I think your guys' dog and then one of Josh's dogs was, like, fighting over who got to bring it back, and so they went to separate They're litter him. mates, by the way, so they're very competitive. Yeah, yeah. And so they drop the, they drop the goose, because the guys are, like, separating and be like, okay, calm down, like, you don't need to show off, and we're, we're like, counting the geese, that, that we like we knew we shot the dogs brought them all back we're counting them and we're like i thought we had like seven why are we only counting six and then all of a sudden i think i think i may have been the one that spotted it i look out i'm like oh because that one like a hundred yards it flopped its ass like a hundred yards away <laughs> and all of us missed it it was like flopping along the ground like trying to get away yep because we had had to separate the dogs and like kind of yeah. forgot that it was there and it right. just was like 
peace out. <laughs> I'm getting the fuck out yep. of here. <laughs> oh yeah, brothers. Oh my gosh, that was that was a lot of fun though because it was just it was really cool seeing those dogs work. Like I'd never experienced that before, and I've always been the kind of person I'm like I'm. I'm down to try anything. It's like elk hunting, archery hunting for elk. That's what stole my heart. Like, right. That's what I love. That's what I'm passionate about. But being able to do the waterfowling, the the upland game, I get it now. Yeah. Like that's the cool thing is like I feel like I get it now. I understand why people are into it. And I'm in love with that too. Right. It's never going to be archery elk hunting to me. But I freaking have so much fun with that. So I encourage a lot of women who are interested in hunting to start out upland hunting, start out duck hunting, because you'll kind of just, you'll get it. You'll go and you'll be like, wow, that was really fun. Or maybe you'll hate it. But most women like it. And then it kind of builds from there. Then you're like, well, I kind of want to shoot a deer. Well, I kind of want to shoot an elk. Mm -hmm. Um, And maybe you just stay at upland hunting, but typically it goes on from there. It's a great way to start. Well, I think for women, for I mean, for anyone that that has never been hunting before, that wants to just find out if it's right for them. Right. It's a low impact way to do it. Yep. I mean, you know, even if you're buying every, I mean, most places you can go, you can you can do an outfitted trip, and they'll everything from the vest to the shotgun to the yep. you literally just have to show up in a pair of boxer shorts. And yeah. Like, preferably pants. Um, <laughs> but. You know, you, you're covered. You can kind of do as much as little as you want. But even if you want to buy everything, you know, you buy cheap vests from Sportsman's for 15 yep. bucks. You get a, a shotgun for 250 300 bucks, And, I mean, albeit good luck finding shells now, even nowadays. We stocked up on shells. We bought pallets of yeah. shells. Because it's like, what's the point of having a duck hunting business if you if can't you buy can't shotgun shoot, shells? Yeah. It's like, I mean, that you for a while, that was the only thing you could buy. Now you can't even freaking find shotgun shells anywhere. Right. Um, but it's it's a low impact way. The tags are usually pretty inexpensive. The seasons right. are long. There's tons of opportunity. If it's something you're going to go do by yourself, mm-hmm. it's reasonably doable by yourself. I like, agree. Compared to like an elk, a, a dumbass is going to go on a solo archery elk hunt for his first ever hunt. I don't know who <laughs> do that. Um, but like compared to that, that's a waterfowling upland game is so accessible. Yeah. There's tons of places you can go without a dog, without a blind, without anything. And you can go dove hunting. Oh, absolutely. Like, and they're good to eat. And oh, yeah. You know, it's easy to breast them out. You watch a YouTube video. It's super easy to do. You cook them. They're, in my opinion, delicious. Mm-hmm. I love, I love pheasants. I love grouse. I love chucker. I love dove. There, it's all good. So it's just a, it's a great way way to start. And me, you know, it's a great way to be. It, it is opened up new doors for me, and again, it extends your season. Mm. Like it allows you, because I don't know a ton of people. Yes, we all live for September. Let's right, face it. Like, right. nobody's going to argue if you hunt, you live for September, maybe for East Coast, October. But we're all, I think we're all passionate about hunting. If we could do this 24 7, we would. Yep. And being able to do stuff like that. And that's why I love like predator, like going coyote hunting or even just jacks or whatever it is. Yep. You know, being able to go out and hunt year round, always have an opportunity to take something. And I'm the weirdo. I'm like, I will skin a coyote. I'll throw that in a crock pot. I'll eat that nasty thing. You will not. I guarantee. I've got uh, my buddy. He's a California guy. Of course he is. Jeremiah Dowdy. He's a wild game chef from field to plate. He has an excellent, it is one of the best recipes I have. I I use it uh, on venison neck roasts. I've used it on javelina backstraps. But he has a recipe for wildcat, bob, or sorry, bobcat, coyote, barbacoa. What? Yep. Yep. He designed it for bobcat and coyote. So if you can turn bo- cat and dog into something tasty, no. it's good for a lot of stuff. It's great for venison neck roast because it's just something you throw in the crop. Like, I, I don't bother trying to, like, piece out and grind the necks. I literally just chop the base of the head. Bottom of the back straps, take that whole neck roast, throw it in a crock pot with all these spices, and you've got barbacoa for like taco bowls and taco night for a month. It is so good. So stinking good. Um, 
I'll try it, but just don't tell me what it is beforehand. <laughs> I'll have to do yeah, what well, I'll have to Can you get toxoplasmosis from like a mountain lion or a bobcat? I don't know. I mean well, something to think about when you're eating these things. I'm a firm believer that you cook anything enough. And I mean this thing, like <laughs> I mean I'm talking you're putting this in the crock pot for like twelve hours. Like I mean again, we're talking bobcats and coyotes. So this, these things are going to be tough. Like, no one's, no one's saying they're not going to be tough. But, mm-hmm, <laughs> like, mm-hmm. you're, cooking the sh- you're cooking the shit out of these. <laughs> like, <laughs> Tuki- cooking out the, to- the toxoplasmosis. <laughs> and I'm going to be honest. I, I just, I really don't know what toxoplasm. You're not a wow. cat, pers- cat person. I think we're drinking too much. My worst I'm, first we're, yeah. <laughs> I'm on my third cold smoke right now. In about two of these, I've had, an, I've had a nice buzz for the last 20 oh. minutes. Right? Toxoplasmosis. Yes. No, I mean, I, I, I should more things I should admit, controversial things. I do love cats. I grew up with a cat. I grew oh, up I with a cat cats. and a dog. Yeah. And I, I, I also grew up with an orange tabby that basically was a dog. Like, mm-hmm. it, it was not like the aloof, nasty cat. This thing was like the cat that would come up and like, if you were sick, would like come up and crawl into your lap and like Aww. lay with you. Right. It was just this fat orange. It looked like a stray cat half of mm-hmm. the time. Tabby. So that was the cat I grew up. Those are the kind of cats I like. The little shithead ones that are going to like scratch you up when you, like if you pet them three times instead of two times. Right. Like, I, you know, those... I, I don't condone animal abuse, but I would punt one of those things across a room. Um, <laughs> well, it's, all, it's all coming out after the uh, yeah. on the third uh, yeah. third cold smoke. I don't know. I think maybe we should Google it. <laughs> Toxoplasmosis. Because you can get what is it trichinosis from a bear? Yeah, but if that's if you if a bear has trichinosis, you can cook that out. Like if you cook, that's why you never eat like medium rare bear. You always eat well done bear. Um, and I've of course, bear not. a couple of times, but all I can think about is getting sick when I eat it. So like, I can't really like get over that. it. See though, like, so I was telling you, I was telling you about my friends, uh, Ryan and Hillary Lampers. Uh, they're out in Three Forks, Stealthy mm-hmm. Hunter. Uh, he's been on the podcast a few times. We actually did a podcast. The last one I did with him was about bear hunting. Mm. Bear is their favorite meat, really? hands down favorite meat. They love hunting bear. Um. Love eating, hunting. Uh, he probably, t- I think he takes a couple of bears. He goes to Idaho, takes one or two. You and- know what's crazy? In Idaho, you can bait for them. And you legally do not have to take it. No. Nope. Crazy. Montana is like totally opposite of that. Oh, yeah. Montana, you like. You if have you, a little ritual after you shoot it. If you if you take a goose, if you just breast out a goose, you're like wanton waste right there. Like, right. That was, it's. And I think they've even made the laws stricter this year. Okay, I thought um, they made the laws less strict. I I can't remember. I, I haven't, because I haven't been hunting, I haven't looked. But somebody, was, I think it may have just been my friend's commentary that I was okay. reading. I think he was just bitching about people like, why don't you take them? They take, it may have been Jeremiah Daddy. It may have been that wild game chef, because oh. he was talking about cooking the legs. Okay. The legs and the thigh. I It may have been him or another. I've got a few chef friends that are hunters okay. um i have to look at that but i mean i know for, i know for a fact it's you can't uh you with the canada's because they're a certain size you're in you're supposed to take the the legs and thighs too same with pheasants but i think they changed it they passed legislation this year where you do not have to take the legs interesting it's and i mean let's face it, like i don't know a ton of people that sit and process their pheasants out in the field like maybe maybe you pluck them but i love pheasants i oh, prefer I love... it over chicken i'll cook yeah i'll cook it all i don't care oh no like without a doubt i'm just saying like i think most people just throw them all in a bag and then go process them when they get home Probably. and then <sighs> this is again not me condoning wanton ways somebody please don't fucking send me an email um <laughs> like i'm just saying like Who's really who's really going to get on your case? Like if you're in your apartment, you're processing your pheasant, and you're like, I don't want to deal with these legs right now. Like, I think at that point, you're it's the equivalent of throwing away some ground beef. But right again, use as much of the animal. And I'm like the first guy to say, like, I yeah. any animal I take home, like I 
if I can pack home the bones, I do. And I make bone broth. Yep. My freezer is full of bone broth. Yep. Uh-oh. Dear Lord, punching my <laughs> microphone. I'm, I'm getting really aggressive with my gestures right now. That's what happens. We're having a couple of beers. These are the best podcasts. These are my favorite podcasts. Oh my little, God. little social lubrication. But like I've I've got so much bone broth. Did you in just say social lubrication? Social lubrication. <laughs> yes. I've not heard that. Before. <laughs> um, okay, on the waist thing, I got to throw this out there. Okay. Um, I did a podcast a couple weeks ago. I offered the same thing. If you want pheasant tails, send me a DM, Kara underscore Yellow Sally. I will mail them to you. To tie okay. flies. So I work with a lot of, um, well, being in the fly fishing industry, obviously people always want them. But I think as long as it's in the United States, I can mail them and there's no issue. I think if I was like to go try to mail to Canada, it'd get, I don't really know what there, the details knows, are around that. It gets weird. It gets weird. So mm. if Canadians are weird anyways. Weird. I'm just, yeah. <laughs> Your future wife could be a Canadian. I mean, who knows? Who knows? You're right there. <laughs> And I know I've got a lot of Canadian listeners and former ca- and Canadian guests, um, and so I'm still going to talk crap about you guys. Because, but I love you. I love right. you all. But yeah, so we shoot a lot of pheasants. The guys can't take them home. We have a lot of pheasant tails. I love them. They're beautiful. I decorate my house with them. But I have a lot of extra, and I would love to see them go to good use. And I'd love to see the flies. See now, that is something. I am terrified to get into. You should be. It's terrible. Because I know it will take over my life. No. I love that kind of stuff. Really? Is, it's tedious. Oh, I love that little, like, if I can, like, learn to do something for myself and, like, be part of that whole process. And uh, so, okay. So I'm a huge Dungeons and Dragons video game nerd. Believe it or not. I don't even know what that is. Dungeons and Dragons? I thought it was a board game. Yeah, it is. Like you sit around a table and you roll dice and you say like, I cast fireball. <laughs> I played it. I hit the ogre. Um, nerd. Oh, I'm a huge <laughs> nerd. Like it's ridiculous. And um, so if anybody wants to start a D&D game, just uh, hit me up. Uh, <laughs> shoot a DM to the wild initiative. <laughs> um, but I, I, I love that nerdy stuff. So there's this thing. It, it, I'm, I'm going way down the rabbit hole now. It's called Warhammer. <laughs> And it was like this tabletop game where you have all these miniatures and you build these armies, but they're these like little plastic, just gray plastic miniatures, but you paint them and, you know, you add all this detail and they're like, we're talking like a one inch tall miniature. Okay. There's P like, I was never super good at it, but I loved, I loved painting these miniatures and like spending hours on one little thing, like with this teeny ass little brush. That's like three little. You'd love it was, it was wild. Yeah. I never played the damn game. I just painted the miniatures. Really? <laughs> never once played the game. I just thought the miniatures were so cool and I love painting it. That's why I'm terrified to ever start tying flies. Because I will never fly fish again if I start tying flies. I will just tie flies all day long. <laughs> well, you could. There's some pretty quick ones. Like worms? Easy. Done. Well, even my buddy, uh, my buddy Corey with Birch Barrel, he, uh, I sat down, I went on a float trip with him uh, uh, last summer. Okay. I want to say. And uh, it was right, it was uh, my last visit to Montana before I came up for hunting season. And um, we went on a float trip. And I remember before that trip, I was hanging out with him. We were having a couple of beers at his place. And he was just tying, uh, I think he was just tying like rubber legs or something. Fairly simple. And I was right. watching him and he probably knocked out. Three or four of them in like half an hour that we were talking, like yep. it was just, he was just kind of in his zone doing it, and it was it was cool to watch. And that was oh, I did not need to start tying flies. I have a lot of respect for people who tie flies. That it, my ADD kicks in, and I'm wrapping things a hundred times, and then just picking a, picking up the whole vice and just throwing it across the room. <laughs> so. <laughs> Why Why is there a dent in the drywall? I was tying flies, okay? Exactly. <laughs> I've tied a couple of streamers. Like, I've just powered my way through it, and they look terrible. I feel like it also depends on the... Because here's the other thing. You talk fly... Let's talk fly fishing now for a minute. I, I mean, because why not? We've talked about everything in this podcast, and we're back to fly fishing. There are... 
as many flies and almost different as many types of fly fishing as you, cause you know, we all, you say fly fishing and to most people, you, you get visions of Brad Pitt in a river runs through it, you know, false casting yep. for like half an hour before he gets to that exact spot. Like it's this beautiful art form and it's, you know, only dry flies and, you know, it's perfectly lighting on the water. That's what people picture when we talk fly fishing. There are so many, I mean, you're on a float trip and you're throwing streamers. There's not a ton of difference between that and fishing a lure. I agree. Like... Uh, fishing nymphs, especially if you're fishing with, um, oh my god, an indicator. I was like, I was about to call it a bobber, which don't How you dare, dare call, you call how it dare a bobber. You? <laughs> <laughs> it's like you know, you're fishing a nymph with an indicator. It's how being different? Natural. Is it? It's 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 different. There and they, I'm not saying it's exactly the same. Right. There's different processes. There's a lot of there's a lot of differences to it. Yeah. But. It's not as foreign, I think, as people build it up Mm-mm. to be. And it's it's not this different thing. And so, like, when we talk about tying flies, you say tying flies. You could be tying this, like, minuscule little nymph, beadhead nymph. Or you could be tying this giant, like, mouse streamer thing. Yeah, mousing. Oh, my gosh. Those things. I, I've talked about this before, too. We've got some weird names for flies. Oh yeah! It's like you go, I had a buddy. I was like, Corey. I, he was like, okay. I'm like, okay. What flies do I need to pick up for this trip? He's like, all right, you know, pick out cat puke and this and that and the other. And I'm like, there's a fifty percent chance he's just effing with me right now. Right. And I'm gonna walk in, and it, I'm gonna be. It's gonna be like asking for blinker fluid. Exactly. <laughs> right. Right. But it's but it's real. I kind of wish he had sent me in because that would have been really funny. But they, I walked in, I'm like, I was like super cautious. I'm like, I need this, no reaction, and this, no reaction, and a cat puke, and no reaction. They're like, oh, yeah, so we'll take you over here. I'm like, those are all real things? So there is a lot of controversy about the names of flies and how they're so sexualized now that women are getting into the industry. It does not hurt my feelings. I'm not one of those people who gets easily offended. I think it's pretty funny when I'm like, here's your purple chubby, you know, to a client. And they look at me like, wait, <laughs> what did she just say? Um, I'm I'm yeah. trying to think of some of the more offensive ones. Like I, sex, I actually sex dungeon. There is. Yes, I've heard of sex dungeon. I, I went through and I like I actually took an afternoon and I was like, there has to be a website dedicated to offensive fly names. There and I found a few that were like really weird fly names. That's the dog. And there is there is my dog. There's I'm sure there's probably a fly fly fishing fly named after that sound. Um, <laughs> Are you okay? I have a Boston Terrier and she has a short nose and she makes weird noises. And sometimes. she's 14 years old. Yeah, she's also 14. Basically, everything's wrong with her. I love her. Yeah. I'm, I'm trying to remember, like... Um, Nipple piercing. <laughs> really? I haven't heard that one. Yeah. Um, Chubby Chernobyls. There's... Uh, oh gosh, there's got to be a list somewhere. Weird fly name. I, I found many websites that list off, like, awkward, awkward fly names, but... Those are just the first few that come to mind that I use normally. The cat puke was my favorite. That's good. That I was, use that one. And then the best part is you pull it out and you're like, oh, I get it. Like it you look at it and you're like, like oh, it makes total sense why they call it this. Um, uh, anyway. Okay. So folks want to find Yellow Sally online where are they looking? Yellowsallyfishing.com. Yellowsallyfishing.com and on Instagram it's for you it's Kara underscore Yellow Sally. Yes. And Yellow Sally Fishing it has, it has its own Instagram as well, right? Yes. And so I use my Yellow Sally Fishing. I you know try to post fun fishing pictures, all of that, but you can shop directly from the posts. Um, it'll link you right to my website. We take PayPal, all of the you know major credit cards, and that is just uh, Yellow Sally Fishing. Perfect. So one of the big things Yellow Sally focuses on is really uh, you, you, we, we kind of touched on this for a second. 
it's introducing young women, especially to the outdoors. That is a huge passion of yours and getting girls into fly fishing and introducing them to that. So say, say you run into someone and, um, you know, you end up talking to them and you start talking about fly fishing. They're like, you know, I've always, maybe, maybe it's, it's a woman or maybe it's anyone. And they're like, Hey, I've always wanted to get into fly fishing or the outdoors or this or that, or I want to introduce my kid to, to fly fishing. I think they would love it. I think it'd be good for them, but they just don't even know where to start. What, what kind of advice or words of wisdom would you get to just get someone started into the the outdoors or fly fishing or hunting or any, any of this? So I have a (laughs) three-year-old and I obviously want him to be into fly fishing and hunting and all of that. Um, I've taken him fishing a couple of times. I keep it very short and very sweet. He's still terrified of fish. (laughs) So, you know, I want to get cute pictures of him holding the fish, but he's just not really into it. Um, But I mean, our float trips with him, they're about an hour. So I would say keep everything short and sweet to start. You mean you're not going on the the eight hour, like long river (laughs) float trips? That sounds like a nightmare. With with your (laughs) effectively toddler? No. (laughs) But, you know, I see some people on Instagram that do it and I'm like, that's so awesome. But I think for the majority of us, it's probably not going to happen. Let's, let's also be realistic here. They take about three pictures. They get the good picture. Probably about six out of those eight hours, that child is asleep in a in a pile of life vests yes. in the bottom of that boat. Well, my three-year-old will not nap. So that's also oh, an issue. That's a problem. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, short and sweet. I talked to another mom on Instagram who takes her kids all the time, and she'll bring a tablet. She's like, then I can fish and have fun. Um, for me personally, I like going out without my kid. I hope he loves you it. You terrible I mother. <laughs> oh, for shame. I know. But I'm like, well, I'm not super upset that he's not really into it yet. <laughs> Uh, when he can row a boat, he can come with me whenever he wants. <laughs> <laughs> I, I had a kid. What's, what's today? I've heard a lot of people be like, "Yeah, I had a kid, so I'd have a, in eighteen years, I'd have a DD, <laughs> or in sixteen years, 16, I'd have a DD." Yeah, kind of the same idea. It's like, yeah, hey, you know, I got a kid, so in about you know whatever ten, twelve years, I'd have a, I'd have someone to row the boat on float trips for me. Yep, I'm gonna get him like a little raft. You know, they have all those cute little rafts now i'm gonna get him one of those and he'll row me around i'll fish and drink beer listen to music and there you go there you go make sure he make sure he can drive the shuttle vehicle you know at 16 that would be ideal that's like yeah that's the money that's the money right there yep gosh i gotta maybe i'll just adopt a 16 year old <laughs> <laughs> like that idea yeah <laughs> could you imagine <laughs> guess what <laughs> I'm moving to Haver, and <laughs> I have a 16-year-old son. You're going <laughs> to go adopt some poor kid. You're into fly fishing now. You have yep. no choice. You're, you're going you're gonna to drive shuttle vehicles and row a boat for the rest of your life. He might be into Dungeons & Dragons. Who knows? I'll, I'll, roll, I'll roll some D&D games with him. I'm, <laughs> I'm super down. Uh, <laughs> wow. So this podcast is, has been... we've. There, I'm not sure there's many topics we haven't touched on. Um, do we want to talk about politics and re- even more politics and religion? Like, mm, no. I mean, <laughs> we've been <laughs> trying to think, you know, um, I'm sure we could make it more controversial if we wanted, but <laughs> I think, I think at this point, maybe we'll, uh, we'll just sit back, we'll finish our beers and, uh, we'll call it an evening. Yeah. Well, thank you. I appreciate you coming down again. Milestone. I've actually had like a official Wild Initiative Studio recorded podcast for the first time ever. Awesome. I'm glad it's... to be here. Thank you. <laughs> awesome. Well, y'all, that'll do it. Uh, ooh, I don't even know how to end my podcast anymore these days. I'm a little buzzing. <clears throat> All right, y'all, that'll do it for this episode of The Wild Initiative. Make sure to check out the show notes page at thewildinitiative.com to get links to everything we talked about in today's episode. Big thank you to Kara for hopping on. Y'all, that'll do it for this week. Looking forward to next time, but until then, I hope this episode inspired you to get involved, get outdoors, and plan your initiative for the wild. Thank you for listening to The Wild Initiative. 
please take a moment to leave a rating and review on iTunes or Stitcher and head on over to thewildinitiative.com to get show notes, check out the blog, gear discounts, other podcasts from the Wild Initiative family, and more. 